definitely you can send in your questions via via Zoom or via Facebook. It would be appreciated. And without any further ado, I'd like to take this opportunity. Very exciting topic. The floor is yours. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, my name is Crystal Ambrose, also known as Crystal Ocean, and I am really excited to be sharing this platform with you guys today. Give me one second to get. All right. So my name is Crystal Ambrose, also known as Crystal Ocean. I am calling everyone uh, live from Harbor Island, Bahamas. I'm thrilled to be talking about Bahamas plastic movements, approach uh, community solutions, approach to solutions for plastic pollution. So right now, as it stands, uh, the global marine litter concentrations for the Bahamas and the wider Caribbean are three times the global average. And by the year 2025, scientists estimate that the marine litter concentrations for the Bahamas alone will be some 687 million metric tons. And this is in the place that we call home, and this is in less than five years. You know, So these are the shorelines that we enjoy, that tourists enjoy. Uh, this is our paradise that is soon to be inundated with marine debris that's washing in from various sources. And for a lot of people that come to the Bahamas, a lot of locals, this is our expectation, right? We have the hashtag, I live where you vacation. This is paradise. But when we peel back the veils of this idyllic space, we soon begin to see that paradise is polluted by plastic. And quite often it's plastic that doesn't even belong to us, plastic that washes in from a foreign source. But when we take a closer look uh, inland, especially in the Bahamas, especially in urban areas, we see that the, the litter concentrations, not only just marine litter, uh, but waste in general, um, it's pretty staggered. as there is a lot of illegal dumping uh, that we do face in the country. Um, and when we think about our waste systems here in the Bahamas, uh, the structures are pretty much inadequate. Uh, in Nassau, we have a landfill that occupies about 100 acres of space. Uh, and here, this is where a lot of waste is just thrown and unfortunately burned. But right now, I just want to give credit to the landfill in Nassau as they have Hello, did we lose her? Hello, can everybody? We're sorry, but we seem to have lost her for a second. We can, in that in that regard, we could probably move on to uh, another presenter. 
Um, so I will now introduce Dr. Arsenio Davis from a science perspective. Um, so without any further ado and not to give too much away in terms of her talk, but basically it's definitely going to be about broadening uh, citizen science approach to the scope of biodiversity. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Arsenio Davis. The floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Hi, I'm Dr. Anselino Davis, and I own Science and Perspective, and I also work as the Sustainability Coordinator for Blue Lagoon Island. For me, science is the study of the world around us. We make observations, they lead to ideas about how the world works, and sometimes we test those ideas simply by waiting to see what happens, but sometimes we manipulate the world to see what happens after the change. But in the end, generally, science is the study of the world around us. But depending on where and when we are in the world, that world around us can be different. So for example, taking a wildlife survey within the boundaries of the Equinor oil storage facility would be quite different from just across the street in the forest or in the wetlands to the west at any point in time. But if we were to take those same surveys at the exact same spot in that forest before and after Hurricane Dorian, the environment would be significantly different. We expect that to impact the species present and their behavior. But beyond the world actually being different depending on where and when we are, we may also perceive the world differently depending on who we are. As scientific observers, we each have what I call a pace. You have a purpose, which may be scientific study or just bird watching for fun. We have access and ac accessibility issues. Our, able, our ability to get into a site may be restricted, or we may have uh, vision, hearing, mobility restrictions, or even socioeconomic status can reduce our accessibility. Our capacity to identify birds or other organisms may be different. Perhaps we don't know the birds, or we don't have a spotting scope or, or binoculars, or we don't have updated field guides. But my favorite is enthusiasm. How much do you actually want to go out and look at birds today? How excited are you to go and enter your data? If a bird is by itself on the beach with no tracker or anything on it and no one sees it, it doesn't even exist in science. The bird and the human sitting next to one another not knowing what each other are, that's also meaningless to science. have been working in the Bahamas for decades and very few of them can say that they contributed directly to a Bahamian doctorate holder in their field. And I think that's tragic. And it means most of their work also lacks continuity. In 2001, eBird was launched and allowed anyone anywhere to collect their bird observations and enter them into a global database. And you can even go back and enter your pre-2001 data if you have it. But now it's much more accessible. And the bird observation locations went from just 23 scientists for entering bird banding data at 85 locations to now having thousands of surveys and locations by hundreds of observers. The top six islands between 1980 and 2016 are showed, shown here. 
you have 4,892 surveys on Grand Bahama, 3,607 on Abaco, 3,457 on New Providence, and then Andres, Eleuthera, and the Exumas follow. This is huge for science and conservation. These additional surveys give us more information about species in areas that no, were not surveyed before. Now we can make better range maps and habitat use maps. Unfortunately for the Bahamas, the same old biases creep in because just as scientists would only work on the islands with an airport and hotel, these visiting citizen scientists also look for that comfort and the data is biased to the islands where the money is already being spent and we may lose our opportunity to gather data on islands such as Mayaguana. So here I compiled the list of species we share with Michigan. I got a list from the Detroit Audubon Society and I added some of our local species. This shows how they were reported across island groups. And these islands are almost in the exact order we had in the survey effort slide. But look at poor Mayaguana. But that's understandable, right? Most e-birders do not live here. They want to choose the best place to find their species and be comfortable for the money they spend. I wanted to look into this and see where they go. And it turns out that it's not just at the island scale, but also at the habitat scale. Unfortunately, the global habitat maps were so coarse that they did not show much important habitat differences in the Bahamas. So I wrote some code in Google Earth Engine's code API to create a habitat map for Grand Bahama Island, pulling down satellite data and using my knowledge of the habitat to identify different locations. Now I say that in 10 seconds, but it took a month to write the code. However, now the code is on my GitHub and it's free to use. But what I did was I took all the eBird locations and found out which habitat they were in. This allowed me to calculate the total amount of each habitat on Grand Bahama and see how many visitors used each of those habitats and also how many surveys were conducted in each habitat. These visualizations were generated in R and the code is also on my GitHub. From left to right in each image, we have open water, pine, wetland, sand, urban, grass and high water table community habitats. I hope you all see the difference because although pine and wetlands cover most of Grand Bahama, they actually get very little survey attention comparatively speaking. Most of our surveys and unique observers visit sand and grass habitats. And that also makes sense to me. Many bird watchers are older they're on vacation. It's easy walking, easy birding. They're already on the beach. Their hotel is right there and they can have the bartender come to them right while they're laying down in their lounge chair observing the birds. But yes, many of these observers also actually use more than one habitat type. So I created a network map. Here I used R code and Gephi to map the observers as little black dots. And the habitats are mapped using colors based on the previous slide. The nodes of the habitat show how many connections they have. So they get bigger if there are more connections there and they're smaller if there aren't that many observers using it. You can see around some of the habitats, there's a little halo of black dots with just one connection. And those are observers that have only visited that habitat type. In the middle here, these observers have visited several habitat types. And you can see the uh, observers that are just connected between two, they only visited those two habitat types. So now you're asking yourself, do these observers only do one survey or do they do multiple surveys? How do they spend their time? Now we think fourth dimensionally. 
in the same space, observer effort can change. The observers can get better, or you can introduce new observers to the community, and you can have observers who are much better or much more committed. This is a rough 24 hour clock with the observers connected to the hours in which they started their surveys. There are two observers that went out at midnight or 1 a.m. They are the hardcore birders. But apparently no one's hardcore enough to go out at 2 a.m. to go looking for birds. But you can see an obvious difference in the effort that people put in throughout the day when they're going looking for birds. But this image is my favorite. This image shows every e-birder that has ever e-birded a bird on Grand Bahama. Each little black dot connected to a colored dot for every survey they ever completed, and the colors are based on the survey habitat. The little black dots are the observers. That big pinkish cluster is Erica Gates, the most prolific e-birder in the sample period. Her e-bird surveys and her name are public and she is known for bird watching so people who come to visit her birders bed and breakfast in Grand Bahama know to go to her. But just below Erica's cluster is this cluster of black. That comprises hundreds of e-birders that only did one or two surveys. This is my little universe of bird watching. This is the impact that a local birder can make on the biodiversity record, and it hits home because I was the first student on the Kirtland's Warbler Research and Training Program. From 1988 to 2001, there was a single Kirtland's Warbler reported. And if you don't know, the Kirtland's was the rarest songbird in North America and on the endangered species list until just last year. In 2001, Eric Carey, the executive director of BNT, along with doctors Joe Wonderly and Dave Ewart, got this brilliant idea to teach Bahamians how to identify birds and conduct field research. In 2001 to 2007, there was lots of walking through the bush, and we found more Kirtlands than were ever seen in the Bahamas in about a century. Bahamian students got educated in science, but here's a ticket. We came home. And most of us are now working in conservation in the Bahamas. Great social impact story, but there's also a conservation story. Since the papers were published and we made it known what type of habitat these birds are most likely found in, the numbers of reports have skyrocketed. And you can see the difference from pre-2001, 2001 to 2007, and now 2008 to 2020 the difference in the amount of eBird records of Kirtlands. When I came home, I eventually joined the Nature Conservancy and I took part in BNT's 50th anniversary survey of the Exuma Keys. I found two Kirtlands warblers. When I, saw the, when I saw the first one, I was alone with my camera and I didn't think anyone would even believe me because anyone could claim to see a Kirtlands warbler by themselves on an uninhabited island that had never been surveyed before. For the second bird, I was actually with Dr. Ethan Freed, and he's the best botanist you ever want to be in the bush with. But when I was gushing about the rarest songbird in North America on a key that's never been surveyed, that just happened to be there on the day that I was not underwater on the marine team with Dr. Heather Mason Jones, those, I was so excited about this bird. And Dr. Freed asked me, what tree is it on? And I found that hilarious, but at the same time, it put a really harsh light on the possibility that these birds may never have been detected if someone did not think, perhaps we should teach Bahamians to do this work. North American academic researchers cannot leave their universities mid-semester to just pop down to go e-birding. In fact, very few people used to come down and go e-birding. Before 2009, actually, there were less than 100 surveys in the entire Bahamas each year. Bird monitoring training in 2009 on New Providence created a little peak in the data, but that sparked interest and brought scientists and researchers for the regional meeting of Birds Caribbean 
now, which was the Society for Cons Conservation and Study of Caribbean Birds, in 2011, they swarmed or they flocked to Grand Bahama. And after that, the surveys tripled that year. But by 2015, Grand Bahama alone had nearly 2,000 bird surveys conducted. This means tourists and tourism dollars. So while I was completing my PhD, I thought about the impact this could have. And when I returned to the Bahamas to work for Blue Lagoon Island, I made it a point to survey birds every time I went to the island. Only 36 species of bird had been identified on Blue Lagoon Island prior to 2019. In 2019 alone, 62 birds were identified in the first year I was collecting data, and now we're up to 73 species. Yes, I doubled the, biodiver the bird diversity record on the island, but we've also added several species of lizard and snake to the scientific record for that island, and we're working on the insects. The birds were probably always there the entire time, but now you have a human being there with the ability to identify the birds and the desire to record the data. And that makes a difference. Bird watching is a common pastime for non Bahamians, but we are not told about this in school and we are not given the tools to participate in bird watching. But we're a tourism driven economy. So let's get some of that money that bird watchers have. It's a lucrative industry at a small scale. And these are low hanging fruit. We can educate ourselves. eBird and the Merlin Bird ID app are both free to download and use. Educate ourselves about the birds, plants, geology, fish, integrated in schools. My son at age two could distinguish between a laughing gull and a ruddy turnstone. So a high school graduate should be able to lead a bird tour. Teachers can contact me or the Bahamas National Trust Discovery Club to integrate birds and plants into their curriculum. They can contact Brief or Dolphin Encounters to integrate marine science. And you can integrate it into your business. The Bahamas has 12 islands listed in the Caribbean birding trail with 51 birding locations. Get your hotel or experience listed. Reef's underwater sculpture garden took that location from 14 species to over 100 marine species in the Southwest Marine Managed Area. And people travel the world to see that coral nursery and sculpture garden. And they list the fish species they see in reef.org's fish reporting network, just like they list the birds they see in eBird. And that could be your property that people are flocking to so that they can see some rarity. Why am I bringing up fish and showing you a sea grape tree? Students in Brief's wildlife tours, BNT's Discovery Club students, science and perspective followers, and Blue Lagoon Island staff and guests all say the same thing when introduced to the environment and the species in it. I had no idea this was here. So let's do this. Let's integrate into our business, schools, and life. Let's get our guests excited to eat a sea grape a fruit or a ponciana flower. Take a spider selfie or see their first coral. These things are free to look at, to point at, to experience. We're looking at a revolution in tourism now, and we should be watching the bird watchers and training our own. Here are some of the links that I talked about inside the presentation, and you can follow me or find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Psy Perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for a very enlightening job. Um, very timely as well. Uh, habitat, ha habitat mapping, especially from a local perspective, is very essential in environment and ecosystem management systems. So local knowledge is definitely critical. Uh, so there's absolutely no substitute for local knowledge. I'd also like to take this opportunity as well to remind everybody to to be following the, the health guidelines issued by the national authorities to keep safe during this time and uh, ensure that we continue to practice social distancing. Um, it's definitely all of our responsibility. So I'd like to bear that, I'd like everybody to bear that in mind. Um, 
I'm going to give an opportunity to Crystal Ambrose to continue her, 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 her presentation. Crystal, um, if, you, if, you, if you may. Yes, hi, I am here. I am so sorry. All this time I was just keeping my fingers crossed that the power didn't go out, but instead my laptop decided to randomly uh, reboot itself. But I am back. Just give me a second to get the presentation ready. Thank you for your patience. Oh, wait. <coughs> All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right, perfect. Let's pray my laptop agrees with me. All right, so for those of you that missed it, my name is Crystal Ambrose, also known as Crystal Ocean, and I am the founder and director of the Bahamas Plastic Movement. I'm really thrilled to be on this platform today, uh, sharing a space with other Bahamian researchers uh, in the field of conservation. Um, and today I'll be talking about my organization, Bahamas Plastic Movement, and our community solutions uh, to plastic pollution. Um, so as we are aware, plastic pollution, it is a dinner table topic, at, at, this point in time, um, it's everywhere. Uh, so much so that in the Caribbean region alone and in the Bahamas, the marine litter concentrations are nearly three times the global average. And by 2025, which is only in five years, the marine litter concentration for the Bahamas alone is expected to increase to some 687 million metric tons. And what that means is that soon the the amount of plastic invading our shorelines will soon displace the biomass of people that actually live in the Bahamas, right? And this is our paradise. This is the beaches that we love to enjoy. This is the beaches that tourists, uh, in fact, 70% of tourists come to the Bahamas to visit. Um, and this is their expectation, right? But when we peel back the veils of this idyllic space, we soon begin to see that our paradise is polluted and quite often uh, by plastic, uh, plastic that doesn't even originate from here um, in most cases. But when we take a closer look inland uh, in the Bahamas, we see that it's not just plastic that's washing ashore. It's not, not our fault, right? There's also a lot of illegal dumping that still takes place uh, throughout the Bahamas and in small islands uh, like on Eleuthera, where I, I was gonna say where I'm from. I'm from Nassau, but I spent so much time here. Uh, but small islands like on Eleuthera, we have these um, makeshift landfills where we just put all of our waste and we deliberately burn it. And for a small island nation of close to 400,000 people, the Bahamas ranks 13th in all the world for the country that produces the most garbage per capita per day. And that's a lot. So when we think about this issue as multifaceted, um, and when we think about climate change and the fact that climate change is actually intensifying, uh, we see that we're now dealing with waste that washes ashore from a different source, waste that we produce, and now also disaster debris. As with um, Hurricane Dorian last year, we were left with some 1.5 billion pounds of debris. And, you know, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge all of those that were impacted by Hurricane Dorian. So you see, it's really, uh, it's a great issue. And for me, like, I never set out to study garbage. Yeah, I used to do marine science. In fact, I did a lot of expeditions with Lino, you know, counting fish and doing surveys in the Exoma Keys Land and Sea Park. But eight years ago, I got this opportunity of a lifetime to sail across the Pacific Ocean to study the Western Garbage Patch. And it was here that I saw firsthand the impact that plastic pollution was having on the ocean, especially, you know, the oceans that we all love so dearly. Um, so after this experience, I came back home charged up, wanting to quote unquote, make a difference. Um, and I did just that, it took some time. Uh, but I did just that, and I founded the Bahamas Plastic Movement. And we are a local nonprofit, the grassiest grassroots organization you'll ever come across. We have no physical location. Um, I call it a backpack organization. It goes wherever I go. And we are really just um, a small organization that's driven by volunteers and community and strategic partnerships and collaborations. And that's how we get a lot of the work done. Our, our organization is focused on raising awareness and finding solutions to plastic pollution. And we do this by placing community right at the center to be a part of developing these solutions. 
Uh, so we focus on four pillars, research, how do we understand what's the extent of the issue, education, uh, how do we get this information out to the masses, uh, citizen science, how do we bridge the gap between community and science and get the average layperson onto the beach with us to collect data, you know, so that they can see that science doesn't require a microscope or a lab coat, but it could be as simple as picking up a piece of plastic off of a beach and quantifying it, that's science. And then policy change, how do we utilize all of the information from our pillars to push policy that addresses um, marine debris and waste management in the Bahamas? Um, so this whole organization actually started through a citizen science research project um, that I started back in 2013 called the Plastic Beach Project. And with this, this Plastic Beach Project, we aim to understand how plastic was moving over space and over time on 16 beaches within South Eleuthera. And these beaches were either exposed to the Atlantic Ocean, um, which is, you know, deep body of water, the Exuma Sound, which is a deep sea basin in the Bahamas, and then the Bahama Bank, which is really shallow uh, carbonate sand bank. Um, so I would get students uh, to come to the beach with me, and we would look at micro and macro marine debris data. Uh, but we also wanted to see what was the most dominant debris type. And lo and behold, plastic uh, was the main culprit. Uh, it represented 93% of all debris types collected. Uh, and it was the most dominant debris type across all exposures, which means it doesn't matter which beach you go to in the Bahamas, you're going to find plastic, um, especially if you go to Atlantic Ocean beaches, uh, because windward beaches in the Bahamas, they all act as a sink. Uh, for marine debris and we have the currents that bring debris here from as far as Africa from the southern Caribbean and it's deposited uh, right onto our shorelines um, but I got all this information and I was like all right that's cool we got it published that's great uh, but what happened next um, and for me I know science didn't mean anything if it wasn't shared with the right people and the right people being the people on grounds, Bahamian uh, people in small island communities that are impacted uh, by plastic pollution and by other conservation issues. So for me, I knew environmental education and youth activism was the way to go. So even though our organization is so focused on plastic pollution, it's truly rooted in the hopefulness that comes from engaging young people in environmental education and activism as it revolves around plastic pollution. Uh, so a number of ways that we do this is through action-based engagement and beach cleanups are a big part of our organization. We host about two major beach cleanups every year and to date we've removed almost 10,000 pounds of marine debris from beaches throughout the Bahamas um, across eight different and have engaged almost a thousand volunteers. A little sneak peek, hopefully this video plays, you'll get an idea of what our beach cleanups are like. I don't hear any sound. So unfortunately, I can't figure out the sound on this right now, so I'll just let it play and figure it out for my next video. But basically, you can see we engage a lot of young people. This particular beach cleanup happened um, in Governor's Harbor uh, for World Oceans Day of 2019, and we engaged maybe eight, 80 uh, participants. The Bahamas National Trust, the Leon Levy um, Plant Preserve, was also a partner in this and we just had the most amazing time. So it's not just like going to the beach and drowning in the sorrow of how polluted they are, but it's using that as an empowerment tool to say, hey, this is your beach. You can take action by simply picking it up. And the beach cleanups that we have, especially World Oceans Day, they are precursor to our big summer kickoff, uh, which is usually our plastic pollution education and ocean conservation summer camp. Um, for those of you that know me, you know this is my baby, my heart and soul. Uh, by the skin of our teeth, yesterday we just wrapped up our seventh year of programming in the COVID era, right on the heels of this two-week lockdown. And our plastic pollution camp, or plastic camp for short, 
It's a tuition-free program that takes students on a holistic journey from the problem with plastic to solutions to this environmental crisis. And again, it places them right at the center of being solutions. Uh, it helps them to understand that their voices are important, that they have uh, the power to make a difference uh, and do what it takes. So throughout the course of five to six days, these students are fully immersed in scientific research and education and art and activism um, and community outreach, all as it relates to plastic pollution. And I have a video, let me see how I can do this sound. So I'm gonna play the video, I don't wanna waste time with the sound, but this is from one of our programs in Cat Island. So you can see some visuals, I'll just narrate. So every year we have a main program in Tarpon Bay Eleuthera, and that's our, our flagship program. And then we also have satellite programs where we go to different islands in the Bahamas and we engage youth there. And to date, we've engaged more than 800 students in our plastic pollution camps across eight islands in the Bahamas. We've engaged 200 teachers uh, in this work, strategically partnered with tons of local organizations from Space to Create, the Harbor Island Green School, Bahamas National Trust, Brief, and again, you see See the students there engaged in science um, in all these activities uh, so that they're empowered and they have the tools that they need to create solutions. Um, but I can just find it's not just go pick up plastic, let's talk about it. It's actually rooted in something that's, that's really tremendous. Uh, we call our students the plastic warriors because they're the ones, <clears throat> excuse me, that are at the forefront uh, fighting the good fight against this issue. Um, so I created this thing called the Plastic Warrior Feedback Loop, and this is the foundation of our program. It's rooted in the core values of stewardship, empowerment, creativity, leadership, and activism. And how our students come into the program is through environmental education, that connection with nature, not drowning them with all that's bad happening in the ocean, but connecting them to nature because you love what you protect or you protect what you love, sorry. You know, so getting them to love nature. Then we engage them in the citizen science research uh, that then spawns into our community action where they engage in local restaurants and businesses in plastic reduction strategies. Uh, then there's knowledge sharing through the public education. At the end of our program, the students put on a community show where they incorporate Bahamian culture um, to raise awareness of the issue. Uh, everything that they learn is then channeled toward public policy. How can we engage lawmakers into, again, creating these effective strategies and policies that address waste management in the Bahamas. And then youth leadership, you know, they come into our program as campers and they leave in this leadership capacity so that they can come back and become um, camp counselors or junior counselors. You know, so in the scientific research that our students are engaged with, they're out on the boat trawling the exuma sounds, looking for microplastics at the sea surface. They're cutting open the stomachs of fish like mahi-mahi and um, bird boluses like albatross and shearwater gulls. And they're seeing the impact that their lifestyle on land actually has on animals, especially animals that they like to eat. Uh, last week at our Ocean Ambassador Club, we dissected a mahi-mahi and we found four pieces of microplastics uh, in its stomach. And the same with the shear water, two pieces of microplastic in its stomach. So it's in their face, it's hands-on, it's tangible and it's real. And that drives them to want to use their voice to educate others. Uh, we also do a lot of media projects, you know, how can students use their voices in a fun, creative way to give the general public tips and tricks uh, to reduce plastic intake. So this is our Ocean Friendly Life series, one um, in the plastic tube. Uh, we also do a lot of art activism. The plastic that we collect from the beaches, it's upcycled into murals and we put them in public spaces. This is at the Rock Sound International Airport and also at the Tarpon Bay Clinic. And you see here Daisy Dolphin, she's saying stop trashing our treasures. And again, these are all designed by the students. So it's very much student led. Uh, through our community outreach, we have trash and fashion shows and community action projects uh, where, again, student leadership, you see in this photo, Doniqua is modeling Capri Sun trousers and a Capri Sun tote bag, and she's wearing beach plastic earrings. And she was taught to make those by two former campers um, who really loved art, and they were able to incorporate their love of art and plastic pollution to create fashion with a statement. Um, we diverted 
thousands of plastic bottles from going into the landfill and we made um, trash cans with those and gave them to different nonprofit organizations in the community and again you see here the students they're using their voices and behaving culture to write six oh, sorry songs and skits and dances all about plastic pollution uh, currently I'm based in Harbor Island and I just wrapped up a residency at the Harbor Island Green School and here I was able to incorporate everything that we do in our plastic education camp and do it into the ongoing academic school year uh, with students as young as five years old all the way up to uh, middle through high school. And as of yesterday, our Ocean Ambassadors Club, uh, which is a after school program and again it bridges the gap between our summer programming and the ongoing academic year. And our students, we diverted about 2,000 plastic bottles and wrappers from going into the local landfill. And we use that to make an eco brick bench where basically you take all these wrappers and you stuff them really tight into a plastic bottle and you could use those to make structures. So yesterday in the community of Harbor Island, um, with the member of parliament present, with the chief council present and other community members, our students were able to unveil this project they were working on. So you have something that's functional that people can sit on, but something that's also educational because it allows for the conversation of what's the issue with plastic pollution? How is this affecting our community and what young people from the community are doing about it? Uh, so as you can see, our organization is very youth centric. Uh, in 2017, 80% of our staff were between the ages of 14 and 16, you know, and two thirds of them were former campers. So again, it's that doctrine that youth are the change and you can do it because we really believe that uh, they're powerful and effective leaders. You know, they're full of ideas. In fact, I get all my ideas from my students. We got the big WhatsApp chat and I'll be like, what y'all think about this? They're like, Miss Crystal, that's boring. We should do it this way. Um, they're socially connected, you know, between the TikTok and the Instagram and WhatsApp, all these things. They really have a platform where they can share this message. And I truly believe that youth are the change. Um, so much so that in 2017, December 2017, I knew that it was time, you know, we've been doing the work with the organization for so long, but I was still very nervous about approaching policy. Um, so I hosted a youth activism workshop uh, in Rock Sound Luther with our former campus. And I brought in a social scientist to teach the students all about how do you write a survey? How do you measure attitudes and perceptions of locals as it relates to a potential plastic ban? I brought in a local lawyer and she taught us all about legislation and how it works in the Bahamas. And with the help of the students, we all studied different countries um, to see what their approach to plastic bans were. And with the lawyer's help, we were able to write a bill uh, for a plastic bag ban for the Bahamas. And we took that bill, we flew from Roxana Luthera all the way to Nassau to meet with the Minister of Environment on January 3rd, 2018. And we were like, first I was like, oh kids, we gotta be formal. They were like, no, Miss Crystal, that's boring. We gotta go in there beating on the desk. And we did, um, you know, and they were shouting, we are the change, we're the solution. We can fix this plastic pollution. And that got the minister's attention. And we told him by April, um, of 2018 we wanted him to push this through the house of assembly and he did just that and now we have a plastic ban but i also want to acknowledge that the ministry of environment were working on this way before i had any idea um so i just want to give them the credit for that and this is this is where we are and when we talk about conservation in the bahamas globally it's really tough you know especially with plastic pollution it's a fine line between depression and inspiration. Uh, but I stay on that line of inspiration because I work with young people and I know that with them, there is hope for our communities for conservation, um, not only in the Bahamas, but the wider Caribbean and the wider world. Um, so stay stoked, keep doing the good work. Uh, if you wanna learn more about Bahamas Plastic Movement and the work that we do, please visit our website, bahamasplasticmovement.org and check us out on all social media platforms. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal Ambrosi. Very, very inspiring, I must say, um, from, a, from a few perspectives, actually. One, you're working with the, with the youth of the nation, because the youth definitely be in the future. And number two, definitely in terms of waste management, it's something that definitely needed to be profiled and highlighted within the country. So it's definitely refreshing to see the work that you're doing and continue to be, be doing. And definitely, um, you're asked to reach out if there's anything that we can do to assist you in on that platform. But congratulations, definitely, on the work you've done. Um, enough can't be said about it. I'd also like to highlight at that time, basically, just what our previous speaker, Dr. Davis, had said in terms of 
um, opportunities that are available. Because one of the things that we have to think about, the conservation is key. One of the things we definitely have to think about is opportunities within um, these uh, various aspects of our, of our economy in terms of diversity, diversified economy. So I thank him again for sharing that information and also sharing the potential of various opportunities that are potentially av avail available, available to us. Um, before we go on as well, I'd like to just highlight um, to our next speaker, I'd like to highlight the natural history of the Bahamas field, or the, well, the Bahamas book basically is a field guide that is definitely small enough to carry on trips. Very comprehensive guide that deal with terrestrial, coastal flora and fauna, including species, common names, location, details, description. The book was put together by experts in the Bahamas with ecology with contribution by more than 30 other naturalists and researchers. Uh, it covers organism studies in the Bahamas. We're talking about local knowledge now, so definitely it's very timely. So species, cover species in the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Island, Island is available for sale in the province at Logos Bookstore, also at Media Enterprises, and as all national park offices that the BNT manages throughout the Bahamas. The book could also be purchased online at Cornell's University and other book retailers such as Amazon, for Kindle, and by mail. It uh, should be noted that all royalties from the book sale benefit the Bahamas National Trust. So it's a great way to uh, support um, BHNC and support us to be able to provide such valuable insightful, insightful information in terms of protection of our environment and conservation on the whole. I will now move on to our, to our, next, to our next speaker, um, Natalie Maiolis from the Nature Con Conservancy. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, Crystal, for getting us pumped up and energized about community conservation. And I'd also like to thank the Bahamas National Trust for hosting the Bahamas National History Conference and still moving forward with this virtual platform to educate all during these times. Um, with that said, good afternoon. My name is Natalie Maiolis. I'm a conservation practitioner with the Nature Conservancy's Northern Caribbean program. I'm here in the Bahamas. Our office is definitely from Abaco, and it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Um, on the theme of community conservation, um, we'll be looking at, in the next 15 minutes through my presentation, how we can involve not only communities, but the users of resources and specifically fishers. First, the Nature Conservancy's vision throughout all of our work is a resilient Caribbean where both nature and people can thrive. The Nature Conservancy is a nonprofit, non governmental organization, um, international organization. We work in over 70 countries around the world, and we work in 17 countries and territories within the region. And our priorities for the Bahamas are to ensure a healthy, productive ocean, safeguard against the impacts of climate change, and restore, protect, and monitor coral reefs. Now, the Nature Conservancy has been working in the Bahamas for over 20 years. And through that time, we have truly learned the importance of community engagement, stakeholder engagement, and education in order to move the conservation needle forward. And oftentimes, um, we have found that when it's not done correctly or if it's not done at all, it's very difficult to move our conservation needle forward. Now, I'm sure that those of you that are conservation practitioners listening in or those of you that are simply citizens interested, I'm sure that there have been times when you have heard about science or heard about new research or heard about a new policy and said, what are they talking about? Well, most of the times conservation engagements occur with something like this on my screen. We hold community meetings, we invite participants to come. Normally these are in community um, government meetings or public meeting places. And we present to the community our research, our findings, or educate them or try to persuade the community to support um, a conservation policy. But oftentimes these engagements really do not reap us any benefits. And it's very difficult to explain 
um, and also to motivate persons to support conservation in this type of platform. So the Nature Conservancy developed an engagement process specifically for fishers to engage communities and fishers in the research process and help them become a little bit more involved um, in the policy process as well to build ownership and buy-in from the community. So before I move forward with explaining what our engagement processes are, how we implemented them and their impact on the community, I wanna play a short video um, that highlights our work. These engagements give fishermen and communities an opportunity to see how scientific research is conducted and be a part of that process. By the end, fishermen are asking for more information on how they can further get involved in research. We hope that by conducting these engagements, can come together to work towards sustainable fisheries, not only here in the Bahamas, but around the world. So that was a short video of the engagement process that we have developed to specifically engage fishers on the importance of proper management of the queen conch species. Now, for this presentation today, I'm going to be specifically talking about our engagement on fishers um, for the queen conch and how our engagement um, improved um, not only the um, support for queen conch management within the community, but also how these engagements were able to improve um, the capacity of fishermen to correctly measure queen conch lip thickness and also improve education and trust building between conservation organizations and, and the community itself. Now, when we set out with this, when we set out to originally conduct these engagements, we knew that we wanted to work directly with fishers. We wanted to get outside. We wanted to meet fishers where they were to number one, educate fishers on queen conch biology, to understand and see how these engagements can change their support for policy measures for queen conch. But we wanted to be outside, we wanted to meet fishers where they were. Um, and so therefore our process included us, our Nature Conservancy team, actually traveling to fishermen on multiple various islands throughout the Bahamas and meeting fishers at conch landing stations. Now, ideally, we wanted to be able to go out on the boat with fishermen and go collect conch with them, but due to our limited time and, and budget cherry constraints, um, we met fishermen at landing sites where they bring in their conch. And the process included us training fishermen, um, small groups, because we wanted to really have hands-on engagement with the fishers, so between five to 10 participants in each group. And to be able to measure if these engagements and trainings had impact on fishers' support for management of Queen Conch, we conducted pre-assessments, a pre-assessment and a post-assessment. These assessments were surveys that we conducted um, before the engagement and after the engagement to measure changes in fishers' perception towards conch management, also to see how their education, their knowledge of conch biology hadn't changed, and also to see if, if through the engagement process, if fishers thought that this was a helpful practice as well. So we traveled to four islands throughout the Bahamas. We traveled to Grand Bahama, 
um, Abaco, and also Acklands, and we conducted engagements in Nassau. Now we traveled to these diverse um, family islands because we wanted to include fishers from different, um, different communities throughout the Bahamas, also with different fishing practices in mind as well. And in order to educate fishers, we wanted to reach um, diverse sets of fishermen. We wish we could have done this on every, every island throughout the Bahamas, and we hope that and maybe in the future, and with support from other organizations and community, we can do this um, on every island in the Bahamas. But within this, this, this short period of time, we were able to engage directly hands-on with 35 fishers, train nine fisheries officers, and collect over 150 conch. This is a picture of an engagement in the process. Now, the purpose of this presentation is not to go into the details of the research, specifically for conch. I am more than happy to share our research findings with you um, at a later time, but I specifically want to talk about how we were able to engage fishers directly and the impact of that engagement. But this picture here, you can see that a fisherman is taking a dissection of a conch gonad. Now a conch gonad is the reproductive system of a queen conch. And when we started this engagement, or when we had the idea that we wanted to do these engagements, we had some people say, you know what, we don't really think that community people are gonna be able to learn this really quick outside, be able to learn this in a day and conduct over 25 sample surveys, or that the data will be accurate. But through this engagement process, we were able to show actually <laughs> the country and the world that you can work with fishers, train them in data collection um, within four hours, and within four hours have them dissect 25 conch accurately, precisely, um, and also feel engaged and feel connected to the work and a part of the process. So a little overview of what the participants um, looked like, what they thought of the Queen Conch fishery before engagement. 75% um, of those that participated said that it was taking more and more time to find conch than in the previous five years. And 55% thought that Queen Conch was not well managed, and 15% replied that they didn't know if Queen Conch was well managed. 65% thought that it was harder to find conch um, compared to five years ago. So harder means it was taking longer time, they're going farther, um, they're having to spend more resources, more gas, et cetera, to get the same amount of conch in previous years. And the average experience of those that participated in these engagements was 16 years of conch harvesting. Um, our um, most senior participant had 40 years of experience and our newest um, into the fishery was one year of experience. So do these engagements work? Does citizen science engaging fishermen, bringing them in as part of the scientific process, having them build ownership, how does it change their perception? Do, did these engagements work? Well, what we found is that 100% of those that participated um, could accurately measure conch lip thickness with a caliper. Now, this is important because when we are working on designing proper management for a fishery, it can't simply be a management measure that we, that we think and know scientifically will work. We need communities to support the measure so that we can build compliance. Um, as you may know, the Bahamas, we have the largest EEZ within the, Bah within the region. And we just simply do not have the capacity to enforce and be at every key and island and conch landing site. So we really need to build compliance for fisheries policy. We need to build buy-in and support from communities if these management plans and management measures are really going to be effective and work. And therefore, through this engagement process, we showed that you can, um, you can have fishermen that accurately measure conch lip thickness and are that are willing to do so. So if we want to discuss or think about having a conch lip thickness as a management measure, as an example, then we know that this might be something that's viable to actually implement because fishers can accurately measure using a caliper, a measuring device, accurately a conch lip thickness. We also found that 
88% of participants after these engagements supported a lip thickness measurement for conch compared to 60 pre-engagement. Now, the, the reason why it's not 100 is those that did not support the lip thickness after the engagement so that they were still worried about being able for their communities to make money and that there might not be enough comp that would fall within this lip thickness um, for their community to make money off of comp. But you can see that we had an increase from 60 to 88% of participants that now support a lip thickness measure. And a lip thickness measure is simply a mechanism or one management measure option to manage um, a sp uh, specifically the queen conch um, species to ensure that conch are within or or within a range of being mature before they are harvested. We also found that 61% there was a, there was a 61% of increase in knowledge of conch biology. So fishers before the engagement would explain to us and through the survey would identify how do they determine if a conch is mature, is a mature conch. And after the engagement, we saw that they had increased their ways of indicating maturity by 61%, that we had taught them new ways of determining if a conch was mature or not mature. Now mature just means that a conch can um, sexually reproduce and spawn. But what we really found and what was really, really impressive from these engagements is that after, after the engagements were conducted is that 100% of participants agreed that conch needed to be managed better in order to keep fishing compared to 56% pre-engagement. That right there is success for us because we have been able to go into a community, engage fishers and build that support for increased management because the fishers understand why management is important. Why do we need to manage it? So this here was, um, this was really um, a success point for us. But what do the participants say? Well, 100% of the, of the participants said that they wanted us to come and do these engagements again. They wanted us to come to every island within the Bahamas and they wanted us to come back and they wanted to tell more friends and they wanted everyone to participate because they felt like every fisherman needed to know this knowledge. Because it's not only a consumer or, or a resource user's responsibility to educate themselves on the resource they're using, it's also the responsibility of conservation practitioners and researchers and scientists to inform resource users, especially those like fishermen that are really dependent on a resource for a way of life, on the biology and the research of their species in order to empower them um, to make better decisions to manage their species that they're so dependent on. Um, we also had, I, my favorite, <laughs> I have to say, we, uh, one of our fishermen from Athens, um, he is one of my favorite fishers I think I've ever engaged with. He said, today you taught an old man something new. I came here thinking I couldn't learn anything new and you did it. And this right here shows that really the naysayers that say that, um, you know, some stakeholders are, they don't want to engage with you or they can't learn new things. Well, this is proof right here that it is possible. Um, and when you build that buy-in, when you go to the fishers, when you go to their place and you make them feel included and in part of their resource, a part of their resource that they're dependent on, um, that you can really have some really incredible feedback um, and participation from resource users. And also one of my favorite quotes was one of the Abaco fishermen said, knowledge is power. And that's exactly um, what we were trying to um, hopefully get from these engagements. So what are the next steps? We, we did these engagements. Um, we were able to visit four islands. Well, the Nature Conservancy, we are learning from this engagement process and the successes and the tools that we use within this process, we will use throughout our next engagements as we build more and more engagements with communities. Um, we're also looking in this day and age of COVID of how, we, how can we do this type of engagement in a digital platform, but still be successful um, of engaging um, and really connecting with individuals. And we also share these results with the Department of Marine Resources to help them inform fisheries management as well. And these engagements, 
they were successful um, in engaging communities, educating fishers, building buy-in and support. But the data that was collected, and I don't have time to go into this here, the data that the fishermen collected actually um, was very representative of previous research that's been conducted within the country. And also, it was very interesting because it shows anecdotally, um, it confirms what anecdotally fishermen have been telling us about trends in conch populations, locations, et cetera. And also early analysis also indicates that there are interesting comparisons and contrasts between the conch fishery in Belize and the Bahamas. Um, so we'll be sure to share these, um, these results with management makers and hopefully, or policymakers, and hopefully in the future we can um, extend this process or just use this process as a way for other entities, other NGOs, even government to engage with, with fishers. Um, I want to give a special thanks to the Bahamas Department of Marine Resources and its officers, not only for their support, but also for their participation. We were able to train fisheries officers as well in how to measure conch and include them because they're also part of the fishery and it's their responsibility for enforcement. So the more that they understand about the biology um, and the research process, then they're able to be equipped to really go out there and um, enforce the measures. I also wanna thank all of the fishers on the islands of New Providence, Abaco, Grand Bahama, and Acklands for their participation. These engagements were conducted before Hurricane Dorian, and I'm happy to say that although Abaco and Grand Bahama were devastated, um, all of the fishers that participated and that were in the video shown have survived and their families. I also wanna thank Dr. Alan Stoner, Dr. Martha Davis, and Dr. Andy Coe um, for sharing their methodology. So their methodology developed is what we taught um, the fishers and what was used in the engagement process. And James Foley of the TNC Belize team, um, the Nature Conservancy, as I mentioned earlier, we're an international organization. So we use resources, we use um, our resources and time and experts um, within other countries. And so this was James Foley from our Belize program who conducted a very similar exercise in Belize. And so he helped train us on this engagement process. And last, I have to thank Frederick Arnett of the Nature Conservancy um, for being a great team partner. So thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Very, very informative, very, very interesting. I uh, must, I must, must congratulate you on such a well-presented uh, basically topic. A um, couple of things highlighted definitely in terms of the money that you're building capacity in the country. At, at many levels, definitely at that local level, that level and building awareness, so definitely in terms of the whole species management and getting that buy-in from the fishers themselves, that in itself will definitely enhance the capacity. So thank you again, very much appreciated. And obviously, good to, good to hear that um, right with us, um, that the DMR is hands-on and working with them. I also like to extend congratulations for their work in conservation efforts um, as they have done some work personally with, with the BNG. So, so in, in that light, definitely, uh, I, I would want to extend congratulations to them as well. I'd also like to advise persons wishing to, to stay in touch with um, the whole National History Conference that we definitely will have to keep, you, keep in touch via social media, via our website at BH, BNHC. 242.com and facebook.com, the BNH and BHNC. So we definitely encourage you to follow um, and keep up to date with what's going on within the whole series of conferences and, and sessions as well. And questions, I just remind you, questions and suggestions can be directly emailed to BNHC at BNT.BS. You know, we would like to now move into our final our final speaker. I'd like to definitely introduce Megan Pender and Dr. Heather Mason Jones from the University of Tampa. Colleagues, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? I think we can hear you. Great. 
Good day. We're delighted to be here to talk about our work with the community uh, with the community associated with the proposed Seahorse National Park. So um, my uh, myself and my co-author Megan Pinder will be doing this presentation. Megan is a, an undergraduate student who's been in my research lab since uh, her first year, and she'll be graduating with an environmental science degree in the spring. Partners with this project are, of course, uh, uh, the Bahamas National Trust, as well as a education, uh, uh, the Center for Ocean Research and Education based in Gregorytown, um, which is a, a new NGO working in this field. Sweetings Pond, Hatchet Bay Cave, and surrounding region has a long and storied past and a very rich present. Signatures inside the cave go back to the early 1800s uh, with evidence of humans on site before that time. The region is tied to the economic history of the Bahamas with the iconic silos that you can see along Queens Highway. And the pond has been termed the Loch Ness of the Bahamas. In all my time diving in the system, I've never seen any sea monsters, but diving in it at night is an experience unto itself, of course. But this area is, re is rich in natural wonders. We have seahorses, we have octopus, we have bats, grouper, uh, large crabs, and we have a unique ge geology of the system. Hatchet Bay Cave is the longest dry cave known in the Bahamas. The pond itself is a saltwater pond separated from the ocean, not by a big hole, blue hole, but by smaller cracks and crevices in this outside ridge that separates the pond from the ocean, leading to species inside this pond that have unique biology. Sweetings Pond is on the island of Eleuthera between the settlements of Hazard Bay to the south and Gregory Town to the north. The proposed park boundaries include the pond itself, which is a mile long by a half a mile wide to give you a sense of scale, Hatchet Bay Cave, which is on this side and the surrounding landscape, and then a three mile buffer zone offshore. As a biologist, my comfort zone is the science, and we know more about this system than we did in 2013 when I first visited. Early work by Rich Aronson in the early 1980s at the end of the agricultural period of this site documented octopus, seahorses, and other species in the lake by the early 1980s. Our work established that this population of seahorses is unique in shape and genetically isolated from those in the ocean, so they're drifting to become their own new species in the pond. There are also, this is also one of the highest density seahorse populations in the world. And what we found is at night, those densities go up by, by orders of magnitude and seahorses in this pond are exhibiting behaviors that we've never seen anywhere else in the world. Uh, in addition, we uh, research in collaboration with CORE is showing that the octopus populations have been stable from that early work by Rich Aronson to study the octopus in the early 1980s to now. And this is research that's been conducted uh, with a graduate student, Duncan O'Brien, with the support of Owen O'Shea and CORE. But based on that work and our work, we know that the seahorses have increased in this ecosystem over time. So we know a lot about the natural, uh, about the natural history of this system. So this image here is produced by the Caribbean Heritage Concepts, and this highlights some of the features of the site. So we have here, so it's just an inset map so you can see the organization. This, uh, we have Hatchet Bay Cave over on this side of the pond. We have on the northwest end, see, uh, we have resources inside the pond for viewing, so places where people can see seahorses, even right from the pond edge. Um, we have those iconic silos mixed throughout the site, as well as a mixed range of habitats from mangroves, to uh, dry coppice, we have terrestrial habitats as well. And then we have evidence of this long human use of this site. And some of the, the puzzles that we have to solve haven't even been established yet. So there's, for example, steps cut from the ocean into the ridge to get people over the ridge and into the pond. And we still don't know the history of those. So today what we're gonna be doing though is talking about three examples of how we're working with the community to develop conservation tools. Um, uh, and these are through community education and through community conversations based on best practices in community conservation. These types of programs need to encourage the community to care about a resource, but you can't know what people care about unless you talk to them. So the approaches that I'm gonna be talking about here are have been conducted in parallel well, with more traditional presentations of research results to adults in more formal settings associated with uh, with BNT, BRIEF, and the Nature Conservancy. 
But the, the examples that we're going to be talking about focus first in our first two initiatives on children. This is a strategy that was developed with the BNT and it, it to, to focus on um, um, bringing education into classrooms and bringing kids to the site to teach them about it. And then this last area that we're going to be talking about is an extension from my work with undergraduates that Megan's going to be presenting on. And she's going to be talking about kind of a new initiative that we're working on with community interviews to document the cultural history of the site. So for this first area that we're going to be talking about, these school presentations, the goals of these school presentations um, uh, was that we wanted to get, we wanted to use this unusual system to get children excited about the science going on in their backyard. And sh we wanted to share the science early in our discovery process to bring kids into the center of that scientific process. We wanted to ask them what their ideas were for what research we should be conducting. And through these conversations, we wanted to assess their natural and cultural history of the region. So just to show you an example, top panel is one of these presentations which started with a traditional presentation. But as you'll see on the next slide, these get more active. And this lower slide here is one that I use to talk to older students to talk about this first scientific problem we faced when we walked in the seahorses looked nothing like the field guides, and we had to figure out what species we were working with. So our approach here was that we, we talked about seahorses, but we also talked about seahorse scientists. And the children became both in this, uh, in this approach. So we typically had two team members on this uh, project, myself and then usually Courtney Kemp, who was the educational coordinator from the BNT at the time. But there were a number of other BNT staff who actually participated in these events. We used uh, presentations and question answer formats, and we brought research tools into the classroom. So we brought them waterproof paper, which was a big hit with the kids. We brought in cameras and dive gear, but then we also designed inquiry-based lessons that we used with the children that featured 3D printed seahorses that had been printed based on models that we were able to, to uh, pull, uh, pull from the photos that we had from animals in the pond and we, uh, to give the kids a sense of size and to be able to touch them and feel what the texture would be like uh, based on these 3D printed models. In addition, we used transect tapes to help students understand how we measure things like that this is a high density population by having students in the center of these rectangles that were cre created be the seahorses and the seahorse scientists standing on the edges, helping them, uh, helping do the measurements to figure out what area a table of students were, the students were sitting around to, fix, to help them understand the math ideas behind how we actually calculated seahorse density. We then summarized the student contributions after these presentations. So what did we find? What were the outcomes? Well, we conducted presentations in 18 of 19 Eleuthera schools across 22 groups of children, and we reached a roughly 22% of Eleuthera children across all grades. Almost all but the youngest children knew about ha uh, Hatchet Bay Cave, but fewer knew about Sweetings Pond. A few students had heard about the seahorses, and these were mainly students from uh, local, the local communities of Hatchet Bay and Gregory Town. Primary students were the most engaged in the hands-on hands -on components of the presentations, but almost all of the student groups were interactive. I asked students towards the end of these conversations what they thought we should be studying, asking what did they want to know about these seahorses. And one of the things I was most excited about was that these questions were phrased in terms of what they wanted to know about their seahorses, indicating the idea that this resource is special for Eleuthera and a point of pride for them. This is that sense of ownership of the students over this natural area that occurs right in their own backyard. Uh, uh, students asked questions like what do they eat, do they sleep, and um, what eats them? These were the common questions that students across all grades were really interested in. Teachers were also engaged across most student groups and almost all expressed a desire for both field trip opportunities and in-class materials to use with their students at, uh, about the site. But what was even more exciting to us was that at least half the teachers involved were interested in teacher field trips for professional development. These educator components, along with a high level of engagement of students, led to the next phase of the project, developing tools for use both on site and in classrooms to develop place-based models for teaching. So for this phase of the project, our specific goal was to develop these place-based education materials for students in the classroom. And I chose to use uh, my, my undergraduate students to help us do the legwork to pull together this information and start imagining what this might look like. 
So this was a digital service learning project that occurred this past spring. I had put this into, uh, into place before COVID hit, but it was a great way to get undergraduates to get passionate about ideas and exchange, exchange those ideas across, these, uh, across teams. Um, and the concept was simple. I told them to go to websites of national parks all over the world, obviously focusing on the national park websites from the Bahamas, and to see what digital materials are available. I asked them to think about what digital tools might be needed for developing a park, and then told them for to them to find their passion and pursue it. And what this led to is the formation of eight groups um, that, that self-assorted into these eight development teams. And I'm gonna be focusing on the work that two groups did that were associated with the educational development of the site. And specifically, Megan was a part, who's gonna be talking next, is a part of Team 7, and her work is an extension of the work that we started this spring. So for example, oops, so what did we find? So the, what the students did is over six weeks, they actually developed digital deliverables and those final deliverables were presented in a session. You can see our Zoom window here. It's a total of 42 students, so not all of them would fit up here. But these were reviewed by seven UT biologists and also one outside team member, Tammy Lapalusa, who's been instrumental in the data collection and support process for the Landcrab National Park on Andros. So students in the two teams that we're talking about um, developed outreach materials for teachers to use at the both primary and secondary levels. And, they've, and these were focused on natural history tools that they could use both in classroom as well as tools on site. One of the examples we see that was developed for primary students here is the traditional scavenger hunt to get students to learn about the natural history of this particular site based on long species lists that students were actually provided with um, as the raw material they had access to to develop these tools. Oops. Uh, these are some of the deliverables that those student groups developed. Uh, we can see here that there was general information about uh, that they developed about things like uh, nature of preservation in the area for uh, adults. They developed versions for kids. Uh, they had kind of seahorse specific components and then generally why see or why this area is unique. We had fully formed uh, curricula guides. This is a 75 page document produced for ninth grade uh, science as, and has assessments in it and all the forms and materials teachers would need to, to use to actually get this off the ground. And then we had uh, students develop uh, educational uh, outreach tools for use in things like summer camps and outreach experiences, both at the primary level at this and at the secondary education level. And the primary level was focused on the natural history of the site and, and specifically like what is a Bahamian National Park, uh, you know, what is conservation. But then at the high school, the secondary level, these were focused more on the kinds of science that can be conducted at this type of site and featuring different different types of science and thus different types of behavior, different site Bahamian scientists featured as career spotlights to help students connect back to people in the Bahamas doing this research. Um, we did have grant funding on this project uh, to be in Eleuthera this summer working on it with teachers, but unfortunately because of COVID, our timeline and process has been changing. So these tools are now going to be refined during uh, the course of this fall through the action of two students, Lauren Kulik, who is a, is a combined marine science and education major, major, and then Megan, who you'll hear from next. We're going to be working on refining these tools and then working to digitally now share these materials with teachers and work to try to refine the tools this fall so that hopefully in the post-COVID world, we'll be able to do the fun part, which is to try to then bring these materials back to teachers and to students with the support of, of both the BNT and the Center for Ocean Research and Education on site to actually develop these programs and deliver them to students working with teachers. So community interviews have been part of our team approach uh, in this kind of transition to this third area. They've been part of our approach since we began the project in 2013 because you don't know what people will care about unless you talk to them. So for some, it's the natural history. And students like Zoe and Jesse and Delphine and Megan here, these are people who are, who are gonna be spending time in the system and are passionate about it because they're excited about the natural history. For some people, these are also uh, Levy interns that were there. So for some people, it is the natural beauty of the site that they're most interested in. But the key part here is that for many people, especially the Bahamians of the region, 
what we found is it's the cultural history, the history of this vibrant community in this local area that is something that people want to know more about. And we actually know relatively little about this region during this period of time. So Megan is going to now tell you more about this growing initiative. Like Dr. Mason Jones said, my name is Megan Pinder, and I got involved in the cultural history aspect of this research. Community interviews conducted in the past have helped to refine the science, but now they're taking a central role. Having this information matters because a lot more Bahamians may be interested in the cultural history of this area rather than the natural history. It also allows Bahamians to not only learn about, but contribute to the telling of their own history. So to give kind of a brief background on Central Eleuthera, the Hatchet Bay Plantation was set up in the 1930s by Austin Levy and was vital to the livelihood of not just Central Eleuthera, but the whole Bahamas, which prompted Eleuthera to be known as the breadbasket of the Bahamas. The Hatchet Bay Plantation provided lots of milk from cattle and chickens to Nassau, as seen in the image of the Hatchet Bay Plantation on East Bay Street, store on East Bay Street. It also employed hundreds of people with jobs and provided much of the infrastructure for nearby Alice Town pictured here. Now, to learn about the cultural history, as Dr. Mason Jones said, I was supposed to get to Luther this school year to do community interviews. However, with everything going on, I had to kind of switch gears. So Dr. Mason Jones gave me the contact of Dr. David Campbell, who was a past director of the BNT and lived in Hatchet Bay when his father worked for the plantation. He had a lot to say, so I would just mention some of the points. He spoke on some hard topics, including the racial discrimination that occurred on the plantation and the housing differences between white and black workers. He also spoke about fond memories of swimming in Sweetings Pond and taking the 52 mile boat ride from Hatchet Bay to Nassau. He told me that Hatchet Bay at that time used to be like Sweetings Pond, emphasizing the importance of conserving the pond. I really enjoyed speaking to Dr. Campbell and moving forward, I hope to work with social media to find more people to talk to and hope to encourage kids to get involved with the history of the local area. So where are we at this point in this process? Obviously this is early, this is a site that is proposed as a national park, um, but what we are realizing and what we know is that how you get people to care about conservation, you make it personal and you bring them in. And so this is uh, this uh, we've kind of evidenced this process of, of listening and translating it into the science. We have a number of community inspired science research initiatives, which actually have been I've been uh, 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 kind of addressed from the science side of things. So from the children, we now know more about what they eat. We know what the seahorses do at night. We know what likely what their predators are. And through these community interviews, we actually have uh, developed initiatives to study the water flow through the system and the connectivity of the ocean to the ocean. And we've actually started to, to think about research that will tie um, the actual pond dynamics to potential fishing offshore in that local area. So the community interview process and our discussion with children have led to science, uh, specific science outcomes in this process. And what we need is help from the larger community now to be able to move this to be uh, even more successful. So if you are a teacher or if you know of a teacher who might be interested in reviewing these materials and um, and helping us customize them for use in Bahamian classrooms, I would love to hear from you. Please uh, get in contact with us. And if you're a community member who knows about the history of this area anywhere in the Bahamas or in the world or uh, know people who might be good for us to actually get to and talk to to be able to tell these stories, um, please contact us by going to Facebook and searching Bahamian Seahorse Outreach. You can direct message us there or by contacting us directly at our university emails, um, which are provided on this slide. And I just want to thank uh, all of the people who are involved in this process. Of course, our partners, uh, University of Tampa, 
uh, support, uh, direct support uh, from the BNT through the Leon Lady, Lady Native Plant Preserve, the Center for Ocean Research Education. And I want to acknowledge that the funding for this project has happened from both the University of Tampa International Programs Grant, and it's also been supported by uh, the Office of Undergraduate Research and Inquiry. These are our photo credits. We had photos that were provided from a number of gifted photo, uh, photographers in this process. And I want to thank specifically the principals, teachers, and students of Eleuthera Schools, my marine ecology class of 2020, and the people who were involved in the review of those materials. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Dr. Mason. You were very informative. Uh, so you can see, um, definitely, um, conservation is definitely all our responsibility. And our partners definitely all have done various components of working with within our community, whether it be with teachers or whether it be with fishers. So I guess we'd definitely like to, to thank all of them for, for, for giving us such informative information today. Um, and before we, before we move on, I guess, I guess we'd like to thank them individually. Um, Crystal Ambrose, yeah. thank you definitely for very informative um, final discussion and definitely want to encourage you to continue on with your work and you can hear the excitement and the zeal in your voice so I definitely don't want you to lose any of that and, and continue to do well with, with your various projects. Dr. and Simeon Davis definitely appreciate your, your work from from a perspective of building capacity and also showing various opportunities in the fields that are viable and showing the importance of basically local knowledge in habitat mapping and for to get our various input in as, as well. Um, Lally, appreciate the information definitely in terms of engaging our fishers. This can't be more important than engaging industry and personnel and definitely highlighting the importance of protecting various resources and various species and it's definitely refreshing to hear that a lot of them are seeing the, the, the importance of basically conserving the resources and that that that's very very enlightening in terms as well uh, maybe uh, dr mason jones in terms of working with teachers and you i think is a very interesting way to get persons involved in, in, in science and hopefully your efforts will, will, will in fact lead to uh, seeing more scientists in, in the near future um, and hopefully we will be seeing more train the trainer programs in terms of introducing some basic programs um, to teachers so that they can further and assist with with the work that have been started by organizations like the BNT and, and, and Nature Conservancy and other NGOs in terms of um, preaching conservation of, of, of the environment and ensuring that these resources are here for generations to come. Um, I would just like, before we move on to, on, on the, to the questions, because we will be entertaining questions, um, I, I do hope that uh, we, you guys have, uh, definitely will come and join us for the remaining sessions, and I hope that you've enjoyed these sessions thus far as we continue to try to promote awareness towards our uh, conservation and protection of the environment. Um, so we would definitely continue. I like your support. Uh, we'd definitely be grateful if you would be con consider donating towards the BAKC 2020. Um, hope you're enjoying it. Uh, we would simply ask that you consider giving a donation. Any amount, no amount is too small. Um, an email with a donation link will be sent uh, following this session. Um, I did state that we will be entertaining questions. Um, I will now open and start reading the questions as I have them for our panel guests. First question being, um, what are we prepared to do to involve our children? Discovery Club is limited to expose every child. How will we give every child the opportunity to value biodiversity. I guess for that particular question, no one in particular. Hi, I think that um, question was written during my presentation. And on the one hand, it is 
good to see all of the different content that has been provided or developed by the Bahamas National Trust, Reef, Friends of the Environment. Even the Nature Conservancy has different posters and stuff that you can get. Um, but I think we as Bahamians and as parents, we need to take a leadership role in one, engaging ourselves to appreciate the environment and two, engaging our children to show them, you know, how they can learn and how they can take charge of their own learning. Like I said in my presentation, we're not exposed to this in school, but there's a huge opportunity for us to engage with it professionally later on in life or just as a way of um, entertaining ourselves. So you can download the eBird app uh, for free on your smartphone. You can also use it online if you have a computer and internet. And there's also the Merlin Bird ID app, which is free and will allow you to identify different bird species. But the Bahamas Natural History, the Natural History of the Bahamas book, uh, which the Bahamas National Trust has, is a, is a really, really good book for your budding students because it's not just birds. There's bugs, spiders, reptiles, plants, all of that inside there. So you can get that from the Bahamas National Trust and really just start looking through it. Even inside your own yard, you probably are gonna have like 50 different species. So start there. And if uh, parents or teachers want to find out how to do some of that, they can reach me at Sci Perspective on social media too. Thank you very much. We do encourage persons, uh, persons are offering that you reach out to them. We do encourage you to reach out to them. Uh, take them up on that offer. Uh, our next question um, is coming from Jessica McCarty. She wanted to congratulate Dr. Davis on an excellent talk. And her question is, do you think tourists and visitors who are not birders Thing they need binoculars and other equipment to participate in birding. I I do. I think a lot of people feel like you can't be a scientist unless you wear the field hat and you have the cargo pants and the boots, or you have to have a microscope to do like inside work. But that's really not true, and. I think this is a big part of what I'm engaging with through side perspective. And like I'm, I'm doing videos with the tadpoles in a bucket outside or a cockroach that I found downtown or like just rats running around in the forest. And, and these things, it's just me and a cell phone in the bush or on the street or downtown and science is really everywhere. And so this is what I really want people to take account of is that, your environment is anything that's around you, no matter what it is. And science is just really the way we look at the world. So from there, we just have to take into account our perspective and we can really engage a lot better. Thank you, thank you for that answer, appreciate that. Um, question from an anonymous uh, attendee. What measures are taken to make bug waste easily and properly dumped? Why not add more bins to areas to facilitate bulk waste dumping effectively and then involve community people to be neighborhood environmental citizen scientists? Uh, Crystal, you care of to answer? Can you repeat the question, please? What measures are taken to make bulk waste easily and properly dumped? Why not add more bins to areas to facilitate bulk waste dumping effectively and then involve community people to be neighborhood environmental citizen scientists? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, I am not certain what is being done as it relates to bulk waste. I know right now in Nassau, there's been a huge revitalization of the landfill there. Um, and to my understanding, they have a lot of projects uh, on the horizon as it relates to uh, waste uh, collection, um, you know, diversifying the waste stream and, and recovering that waste back. 
Um, I don't know if they have any citizen science initiatives to go along with that, uh, not that I can speak to. Um, but as it relates to solid waste management, I think the citizen component isn't necessarily science, but community buy-in to see the value in that waste and why it's not just quote unquote garbage, uh, but a resource that can be recycled. And I'm not talking just like quote unquote, you know, oh, recycle plastic. That seems like the green thing to do, but like looking at food waste, looking at, you know, green waste, how can we use this to revolutionize um, our agriculture and create soil and, and, you know, just different streams like that. So science and the bulk waste, I, I don't have a sure answer. Okay, thank you. Any other person who would add a comment to that? Okay, next question from an anonymous attendee. Should we consider, consider eco neighborhood movements or groupings as we have with eco schools? I, I, I could take that question. For me, I believe that every neighborhood should make an effort to get more connected Right now, there's the 100,000 tree planting initiative going on, and you can get just free trees, but nobody has a space in their yard for a mango tree, a dilly tree, and a sour sock tree. So if you have each of the neighbors have a different one, then maybe you could have like a little community farm that's spread across, you know, 10 homes. And then if you get together and you go bird watching and stuff like that, this is an opportunity where you get to know one another. Your community will also become more safe, more sustainable, more connected. And I think there, there's lots of opportunity for this to happen. And I'd really push any of you that know your um, constituency MPs, you know, talk to them about doing these things that would make your community able to be strong independently, but then also be able to support the surrounding neighborhoods. You know, maybe you go a street at a time and develop this. But yes, I definitely think this is something that we have the capacity for in the Bahamas, and it would work really well considering that our communities are much closer than a lot of other countries. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for that. Um, next question at Nadley. I am considering completing a study, a rapid assessment of land crop populations, and a major goal of the project would be to intimately involve local crops. I intend to contact you in this regard. Any preliminary thoughts about this idea? Absolutely, please do that. <laughs> please, um, please involve the community. And um, just a quick tip, and, and to anyone that is trying to involve communities in research, it, we have, this is not the first time that communities, especially even fishers have been involved in research, but make sure, please make sure that you share the results with those individuals after you have it. And sometimes research takes years to get results, but keep them updated in the meantime, because that's part of building trust. And if you only ever engage communities um, because you're just trying to get research from them, they're gonna start feeling used and they might not be able, they might not be as willing to participate in future research efforts. So please make sure that you keep the community um, engaged even while you're waiting on your results. So that's something that we're trying to do right now with our research, uh, trying to find electronic ways to keep our participants involved as we, um, as we wait until we have research, um, excuse me, results to share with them. So please, yes. Okay, thank you very much, Nadi. I uh, appreciate that. That question was also from Del Rico Wannabe. Um, thank you for the question. Um, next question from Kelly Meister. Can anyone currently visit the pond or is it not accessible to the public at this time? 
So as, as of right now, the site is open. You can get in. Um, uh, I, I strongly recommend the southern entrance to, uh, to get into. Um, but one of the things that's really important for anybody planning a visit is to uh, plan to read the information that's posted at both of the entrances at, uh, to the site and really abide by those. So there's um, uh, steps to take to uh, reduce our human footprint in interactions with that space. Um, and so it's, it's important that people are careful as they visit um, and work to not disturb the bottom and not move the animals around and, you know, the leave only, uh, you know, take only pictures, leave only footprints. <laughs> That's, that, we don't even want to leave the footprints. People shouldn't even put their feet down in the water. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, next question is from uh, Nicole Cartwright. She's asking, does anyone have tips as to how we can get globally interested parties more involved with our efforts in the Bahamas? I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to leverage corporate social responsibility, especially for pristine areas in the Bahamas. The um, Blue Lagoon Island, for example, was the first uh, excursion in the country to get the Global Certificate in Sustainable Tourism. And there's the potential for the Bahamas to make this a standard, right? For us to say, if you want to do business with the Bahamas, you have to be equally committed to protecting our country to make sure that your business opportunity doesn't supersede our lives and livelihoods. And once you have those um, measures in place, those laws in place to say that anything that you do must, be, must not impact the human lives in the Bahamas in the future, that's going to change the type of guests that you welcome, the type of businesses that you welcome. And it's really not, I don't feel that it's gonna reduce the amount of business that we get, but we're gonna get a much higher quality of business engagement. We really have a, an excellent opportunity to bargain in the Bahamas for any industry that's coming out of the US. We're the first stop. So if we tell them you can partner with us or if you find it too hard to be environmentally responsible, you can drive all the way around. That's going to hit their pockets pretty hard. So I think a lot of a lot of companies would prefer to have the positive marketing of, hey, we're being really good to the environment and you can go to the Bahamas via us instead of them having that, you know, that public image of oh this is the group that has to drive around the bahamas because they couldn't stop doing x uh negative activity so yeah i think there there's a lot that we can do to leverage that global interest um to protect our environment but also we have so many pristine areas a lot of people do carbon credits so we can use those to actually sell to some countries where they would pay us basically to not do anything. And, and I think that's a pretty cool opportunity for us to take advantage of. Thank you again, very much appreciate the answer. Uh, that would uh, basically conclude our list of questions. I would want to take the opportunity to thank all of our attendees today for taking the time out of their schedule to play a part of, of this webinar. Uh, I found it extremely exciting, extremely informative, um, also inspiring to see that we're getting so many various aspects of our community involved in conservation efforts, in particular our youth who definitely, who definitely are the future of, of, of the nation. Um, again, Thank you, panelists. Um, very informative. I, I sure that persons will be getting in contact with you as well. I would like to thank all the organizers of the DAC, the DNAC conference, um, who continue to work effort, effortlessly in trying to keep this together and make sure persons are uh, on track. 
definitely a special thank you to uh, Giselle Dean, who's definitely behind the scenes. There's a tremendous amount of work in keeping these things organized and make sure the things go smoothly. So again, I would just like to thank everybody for taking the time to participate, in particular, the panelists who provided this excellent information for us today. And without any further ado, um, I again say thank you.